Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me in the back there OK? Yes, thank you. Uh, so welcome. Uh, uh, my name is Kevin McLaughlin. Uh, I'm the dean of the faculty here at Brown. I'm also a faculty member in the departments of English, Comparative Literature, and German Studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, conference, which is really an, an inaugural conference um, that's part of, a, uh, part of the launch of a new series, uh, a new, in, new initiative on, on modern languages uh, at Brown. Um, before turning things over to my colleague, uh, Jane Sokolowski, um, let me take a minute to say a word about the initiative, since some of you may not be familiar with it, and then to offer a few brief general remarks uh, by way of introduction and welcome. The study of language and the learning of foreign languages have been fundamental to higher education since the founding of the university as an institution in medieval Europe. Greek and Latin were understood in the medieval university as sources of wisdom and knowledge essential to human existence. This humanist view of ancient languages was extended during the Enlightenment and in the 19th century to languages in general as singular modes of human communication and knowledge. Modern language study is vital to preserving the ethos of critical reflection and clarity of thought that marks the well-educated person. By announcing this initiative, we are reaffirming the importance of this perspective on languages at Brown and also committing ourselves to supporting language learning at the university and to encouraging students to learn languages and to think about language while they're here. In broad terms, this is a three-pronged initiative. First, establishing a reimagined center for language studies as a hub for pedagogical innovation and interdisciplinary scholarship in modern languages under the leadership of Professor Jane Sokolowski. Thank you, Jane. Two, enhancing our capacity to support the expansion of scholarship and language study. And three, strengthening doctoral education in modern languages, training the next generation of modern language scholars and instructors. The topic selected for our first, as we've come to call it, MLAB, Modern Languages at Brown Conference, uh, translation was intended to focus on the interaction between languages and with the foreignness and on the foreignness of languages to one another. On one level, translation describes the act by which the referential or empirical dimension of one language is carried over or transferred to another one. However, as we know, languages are not only empirical. In fact, they might not be empirical at all. There is an aspect of language, that is, that goes beyond the empirical and that goes beyond the transfer of the meaning of one language to the other. In this sense, translation involves a confrontation with something in language, if we could put it that way, that is not subject to empirical transfer, a certain irreducible otherness in language. Translation, it seems to me, involves not only transferring from one language to another, but of pondering and respecting the authority of what can't be transferred. The university must cultivate and make room for both as aspects, both of these aspects of translation, the ability to translate languages and also the ability to be open to the study of what cannot be translated. This is one of the tasks, and not the only one, uh, that the Brown Language in Initiative hopes to promote. So with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Jane Sokolowski. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Jane Sokolowski. I'm a faculty member in German Studies and the director of Brown Center for Language Studies, as you've already heard. Uh, first of all, I want to point out that it was actually Dean McLaughlin's idea um, for this conference. It was his wish to strengthen the presence of languages on campus and the visibility of languages on campus. He was the one who suggested organizing a conference that was based on and about translation. Um, it was an event that is meant to bring together so many of Brown's departments. 
for which languages play a significant and a fundamental role. We're truly thankful and grateful <laughs> that you had this idea and that you're able to ha uh, give us the support to make it happen. So here we are today, Lower Solomon, see seats 225, we're almost there. Um, and we're at the keynote address for the Translation Across Disciplines Modern Languages Conference. And this brings together 16 different departments and centers and institutes on campus. 16, that's a pretty big number. That clearly highlights the significance of languages at Brown here on our campus. 16, it was hard to fit all of those names on our conference poster, but we did it. Okay. The Center for Language Studies was asked to organize this conference, I think because we're the unit on campus that's responsible or supposed to, is charged with supporting the teaching of learning of all languages on campus. And because this is my affiliation and we are at the Center for Language Studies all about teaching and learning, and translation is only possible if one's thoughts and ideas can move back and forth between languages, I'm gonna take my two minutes to invite each of you here in the audience to continue learning a language you once learned or to start a new one. And for those undergraduates who are out there, those Brown affiliated folks, take the plunge and enroll in one of our many and excellent language courses here on campus. Because you need to sit down with others in a class in the shared experience of co-creating meaning out of language three or four times a week for three and a half months for a semester and only in doing that will you be able to grasp the language and be able to speak and understand the languages. But just knowing the language isn't enough. It isn't enough to master the language, if that's even possible, and become prof proficient. It's not enough to be able to do the type of translation or interpretation that we're going to bear witness to today and tomorrow at our conference. In order to truly know a language, you have to know the language and the culture. So if you come to any one of our classes, you'll see the topics that are always part of our, our classes. You'll see that we include history and politics and business and fashion and literature and cuisine and traditions and holidays. Do you know how to say leap year in the language that you've learned? Yeah, I hope so. If not, <laughs> you gotta learn. And this whole thing about learning, there's a German word, it's a German verb, and the verb is pflegen. P-F-L-E-G-E-N, pflegen. And um, it means to take care of. It's the word for nurse, someone who takes care of the sick. It's the word for the home where you put your elderly when they need to be taken care of. It's the word to take care of your skin, to make it smoother, to make it prettier, to make it nicer. But it's also the word used for language. Dein Deutsch pflegen, die Sprache Pflegen. And so I hope that you are also able to take care of your language, whether it's a new language that you're going to start because I just suggested that you do it, or maybe it's a language that, oh, you know, I learned German, I learned Spanish back then in college, and I should really keep up with that language. I should pflegen that language. It's as if the language is something that we need to take care of. Right? We must treat it carefully and tenderly. We may never forget it because we always want to make it better. And I hope that in the next day and a half when you're at this conference that you gain a greater understanding of languages. And I hope that you always remember to take care of your language in the German meaning of the phrase. For me right now, I need to take care of all the people who helped to make this happen. So I thank you very much to everyone who made the conference possible by suggesting a colleague or sharing an idea, participating in an event, or giving us some financial help with everything. A special thank you goes out to Sawako Nayasaku, who's right there, and to Kusei Atabi, the co-organizers, the two with the ideas and the connections, the two who were always present at the meetings, either in person or virtually, the two who received, and more importantly, answered my many emails over the last five months. I also would like to thank the staff who's here. We've got Jovi and her media team all around. Um, there's Jen Charette up in the back from Conference Services, and um, my folks from the Center for Language Studies, Chelsea Timlin, Alana Sapleto, and Jill Stewart. I thank everyone very much for making this all possible. So 
without further ado, I pass the mic on to Massimo, who is a professor of Italian studies, who was very instrumental in getting our keynote speaker here. Thank you, Massimo. Buon uh, pomeriggio, benvenuti. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce, the, uh, to introduce acclaimed translator and editor Anne Goldstein. When Jane and I first brainstormed about uh, potential keynote speakers for our conference, Anne Goldstein's name immediately came to mind. Not only is she perhaps the most prominent translator of Italian today, but her career as a translator also illustrates the predicament of the translator as a voice and in her case, alter ego of the writer in another language. First, a quick bi biographical sketch. Anne Goldstein graduated from Benning Bennington College, worked at Esquire, and became head of the New Yorker's copy department by day and translator from Italian by night in the 1990s. The story goes that she picked up Italian through an after-hours language class in hopes of reading Dante's Divine Comedy, a desire tracing back to her days as a literature major at Bennington College. In a few years, she learned the language so well that in 1994, her translation of Aldo Buzzi's short story collection, Journey to the Land of the Flies, received the Pen Renato Poggioli Prize. A Poggioli, an acclaimed uh, great literary critic, an Italian expatriate to this country, and himself an acclaimed translator uh, from Russian into Italian, taught here at Brown very briefly in the early 1940s. Over her prolific career as a translator, Goldstein has given anglophone readers the disparate voices of Pierpaolo Pasolini, Italo Calvino, Primo Levi, Alessandro Baricco, and Elena Ferrante, among others, while spending her day sharpening the prose of John Updike, uh, Janet Malcolm, and Adam Gopnik uh, for the New York. <laughs> Primo Levi and Elena Ferrante are, of course, the two very different authors most associated with her name as a translator. In 2004, she became an editor of the Levy Project, the publication of Levy's complete oeuvre, published in 2015, with the goal of giving readers a consistent voice for an author who had been translated at different times by different translators. Among the works she herself translated brilliantly, I may add, uh, is one of Levy's most challenging works and one of my own favorites, uh, The Periodic Table, a sort of autobiography in 21 chemical elements, uh, uh, each a metaphorical emblem of various episodes in uh, Levy's life. Levy, of course, was uh, trained as a chemist. Speaking of the task of the translator and the experience of being translated, Levy, of, who of course knew something about the art of survival through language, once famously wrote, those who exercise the trade of translator, of, of interpreter, should feel honored because they exert themselves to limit the damage of the curse of Babel. The translator, Levy also added, is the only one to really read the text to read it in depth, in all its nuances, weighing and appreciating every word and every image, or perhaps detecting voids or, and untruths. And Levy also compared uh, uh, being translated to a semi-passive state uh, similar to that of a patient on a surgeon's operating table or on the psychoanalyst couch, which would make the translator, of course, part surgeon and part psychoanalyst. Sometimes, as in Anne Goldin's uh, case, the translator can find themselves in an unexpected and paradoxical position, particularly for one who tries to disappear into the text she is translating like a ventriloquist. We need only look to Goldstein's translations of Elena Ferrante, the most popular anonymous Italian writer in the world today, whose success made Goldstein, if not the face, then the de facto spokesperson for the author in the English world. 
More recently, she translated Jhumpa Lahiri's Meditation on her relationship to the Italian language, entitled In Other Words, written originally in Italian. Translating into English, an author who usually writes in English, and reverse, uh, revising the translation together, as I understand, is another formidable challenge that Anne uh, has faced. As you can see, there is no more qualified person in my mind to talk about the task, the craft, the curse, and the blessing of the translator than Anne Goldstein. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Massimo. That was very nice. I hope I don't repeat too much of what you said. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Primo Levi was deported to Auschwitz in February of 1944. One of the first things that he realized upon arriving in the concentration camp was how crucial language can be. Even his rudimentary German, his ability to grasp orders that if not followed could lead to death, gave him an advantage. And in his first book, If This Is a Man, he uses the image of the Tower of Babel, the inability of men to understand one another, the destruction of language, to represent one of the ways in which the Nazis destroyed the humanity of their prisoners. At another extreme of language is the child Herbenek of Levy's second book, The Truce, encountered in a makeshift Russian hospital after the collapse of Auschwitz. Herbenek, as Levy writes, a nothing, a child of death, a child of Auschwitz has no language, yet is desperate to speak. And Levy goes on. His eyes, lost in his pinched triangular face, flashed, terribly alive, full of demand, of insistence, of the will to be released, to shatter the tomb of his muteness. The speech that he lacked, that no one had taken care of teaching him, the need for speech, persisted in his gaze with explosive urgency. Herbenek dies. In the end, he is able to utter only one incomprehensible sound, and it is only through Levy's words that he speaks, that he exists. These examples may be extreme, but they testify to the existential importance that language can have, and by extension, to the crucial role of the translator. How to get the text right, how to convey words, meaning, tone, style. In the case of a writer like Levy, with his passion and care for precision and concision, for the right word, the prospect of translation may seem daunting is daunting. <laughs> but these are questions that the translator faces with every author and in any language. I hope to hint at some answers to the larger issues by talking in a practical way about my own process. Like many translators, I began translating almost by accident. For me, it was a way of studying Italian more closely and intimately. It is true that I, did, that I learned Italian at the New Yorker in a class in which we um, studied Italian for a year and then we read Dante. <laughs> Um, it was a pretty bold move, but <laughs> it was great. Um, it was a way of studying Italian more closely and intimately from the inside, so to speak. I had been studying Italian for about five years and undertook my first translation on my own as a challenge to myself, a kind of exercise. The work fascinated and absorbed me, and then the translation was published, entitled Chekhov and Sondrio, which is a part of Journey to the Land of the Flies. It was a kind of memoir reflection about Italy and Russian literature by a little known writer named Aldo Buzzi. So I came to translation by this not only accidental but somewhat informal route rather than by formal academic study of the literature or through day-to-day -day life in Italy. Since that first translation, I've translated a wide variety of Italian writers, some famous and some, like Buzzi, not well known even to Italians. In part, perhaps because of that route, as a translator, I tend to stick quite closely to the text. I don't feel that my job is to improve or elaborate on what an author has written or to explain or comment on it. In general, I prefer not to create something equivalent, such as translate an Italian dialect into a regional American dialect or accent, a southern accent, for example, or a Brooklyn accent or 20s gangster slang. Um, I will return to the subject of dialect later. <laughs> Uh, I was once asked if there were passages where you need to be creative because the Italian idiom doesn't easily translate into English. My answer is that I try very hard to find a solution without being too creative. Naturally, there are situations where you have to depart from the text, but my aim is not to go too far, to remain, to remain within the limits of faithfulness, which is admittedly perhaps a subjective standard. 
When I start a translation, I usually make a fairly rapid first draft of the whole book. Often at this stage, I put in several alternatives for a word or phrase, but I always leave the literal translation, even if I'm almost certain that I'll change it in the end. I look up words in the dictionary, or rather dictionaries, even words I know, because I always find nuances, synonyms that might turn out to be useful when I make a final choice. The writer, of course, can choose in his language a single word that includes several meanings, connotations, nuances, degrees, or shades of meaning. The translator, on the other hand, eventually has to decide which meaning or even which set of nuances is most important. It's unlikely that the target language has a single word that contains all the meanings and connotations of the word in the original text. Anyway, at this stage, I don't spend a lot of time or effort refining words or thoughts or ideas or trying to figure out passages that are tricky or that I have doubts or questions about. I usually make a list of problematic words and expressions. In the second draft, I try to solve most of the bigger problems of meaning and sense, but there will unquestionably still be many doubts to resolve and word choices and refinements to be made. Although I work on the computer, at a certain point, usually after the second or third draft, I print out the manuscript and read it on paper because you always see things on paper that you might not see on the screen. Awkward or unintended repetitions, for example, punctuation tangles, other sorts of rough passages. In fact, I spent most of my career working on paper, and its value can't be overestimated. Um, I actually know one translator from Czech who prints his manuscript in the type and dimension of the book so he can really see what the translation is, is going to look like and how, how it will read in the actual formal layout. Um, as I said, I use several dictionaries of various types, both paper and online. Uh, Italian-English, Italian-Italian, English, dictionaries of slang, of idiomatic expressions, synonym dictionaries in both languages, and so on. For um, Pasolini's Street Kids, which is full of Roman dialect, I had a Romanesco Italian dictionary. And in fact, the Italian novel itself has a Romanesco Italian glossary. The, inter uh, the internet, of course, is an amazing resource and is always expanding. You can find specialized dictionaries such as Piedmontese or Neapolitan, which were useful for Levy and Elena Ferrante, or etymological historical vocabularies, all kinds of useful information such as maps, botanical and zoological information and names, the components of the type of shutter that rolls down over a shop window, the parts of a door lock, which not only are not exactly the same in the two languages, but are sub somewhat technical. In the case of Levy, I was able to find on the internet the equipment used in a chemistry lab, including pictures. At the end of the story of a new name, the second of Ferrante's Neapolitan novels, there's a scene in a sausage factory, and I was able to find certain details of sausage making. Um, and of course, I consult native Italian speakers, who, however, don't necessarily agree with one another. <laughs> and, and in the case of dialect, likely don't know the dialect of a region of Italy that isn't their own. After all the drafts, after the struggle to arrive at the right word, I think it's important to return to the original text, to be sure of not having strayed too far, and to be sure as well of having understood the meaning, not only of the words, but of the entire passage, of the words in their context, of the word in the phrase, in the sentence, in the paragraph. One of the ways in which the translator is able to convey style so that his or her translations of Primo Levi do not sound like his or her translations of Elena Ferrante or Pier Paolo Pasolini or Alessandro Barrico is, I think, that attentiveness to the original text. Here are three examples of different writers, which I hope will illustrate this. Um, this is the first passage is from um, a a book called Mr. Gwynne by Alessandro, uh, Alessandro Barrico, published in 2012. She went to Jasper Gwynne's studio on the underground, but she always got out one stop earlier to walk a little before going in. On the street, she turned the key over and over in her hand, and that was her way of starting work. And this is from Pasolini's Street Kids, published in 1955. Ricetto felt annoying inside, right in the middle, and decided to skip out on the mall, he left through the empty church, but at the door he ran into his godfather, who said, hey, where are you going? Home, said Ricetto, I'm hungry. You're coming to my house, you bastard, his godfather shouted after him, there's the lunch. But Ricetto paid no attention and ran off over the sun-baked asphalt. All Rome was a single roar. 
Only up on the hill was there silence, but it was charged like a mine. And this is a sentence from uh, Anna Maria Ortese from her book Il Mare Non Bagna Napoli, which was translated into English as Neapolitan Chronicles for various reasons. Um, this is from the story, The Involuntary City. <laughs> Actually, it's not a story. It's a piece of reportage, I guess. Anyway, a small woman, completely bloated like a dying bird, her black hair cascading over a hunchback, and with a lemon-colored face dominated by a large pointed nose that hung over a hair lip, was combing her hair in front of a fragment of mirror, holding some hairpins between her teeth. Among the general difficulties in translating from Italian, or I guess any Romance language, into English, is the fact that English nouns don't have genders, and so a modifier has to stay close to its noun. This means that English syntax is less flexible than Italian, and the English sentence can't always follow the Italian structure. This is a sentence from Barrico's uh, La Sposa Giovane, The Young Bride. Morti la voce del vecchio li riporta in vita, which reads literally, dead, the voice of the old man brings them back to life. In English, there's no way to know, that, to know what dead modifies. In Italian, it's immediately clear from the masculine plural ending e that it modifies the masculine plural noun or pronoun later in the sentence, not the voice or the old man. My solution here was to make, in essence, two sentences. They are dead. The old man's voice returns them to life. Of course, you might object that something is lost by not having dead be the first word of the English sentence. Someone once criticized a sentence I had translated because it didn't end on the same word as the Italian, and therefore a particular emphasis was lost. But doing so would have produced an English sentence that to me seemed tortured. For example, in Italian, it's completely natural to write la lentezza con cui sarebbe risalita in superficie una qualche verità, literally, the slowness with which would rise to the surface some sort of truth, thus ending on the important word, truth. You would certainly come up with a less literal or word-for-word -word English, such as how slowly some sort of truth would rise to the surface. But as with the Burrico sentence that does not begin with dead, it involves a betrayal of another element of the sentence. And I'm sure everybody here knows tra traduttore, traditore. <laughs> Thus, the translator is constantly having to balance the requirements of emphasis and style in the original text with the requirements of his own language. As in the previous example, where would rise precedes truth, in Italian, the verb often precedes the subject and can also be followed by numerous and complex subjects, whereas in English, the subject generally comes first. In addition, in Italian, the verb form alone indicates both number and person. A sentence, here's a sentence from the 20th century Florentine writer Rom, Romano Bilenchi. Quasi dramatici mi apparivano il brusco risveglio, il racconto della nonna, il nonno così tranquillo appoggiato al guanciale. Literally, almost dramatic seemed to me the abrupt awakening grandmother's story, grandfather so calmly leaning against the pillow. Um, whoops, where's, oh. Here, here the verb apparivano, seemed, is followed by three different subjects, the last of which has a string of modifiers of its own. The fact that, we'll, that there will be multiple subjects is signaled both by the plural ending of the adjective, that is, the second word dramatic, and by the third person plural form of the verb. Italian verbs not only indicate person and number, but also contain the personal pronoun. So in Italian you could say, vengo e va, I come and he goes. Whereas in English, except in a series of verbs with the same subject, I came, saw, and conquered, the personal pronoun has to be stated. In Ferrante's children's book, The Beach at Night, there are a number of objects that are characters, the big rake, fire, the wave. In Italian, when these characters act or speak, they don't need pronouns. The reader is free to imagine them, to imagine them as he or it or she. For instance, in Italian, referring to the fire, we read simply scoppietta, it, he, she sputters. In the end, I decided to use personal pronouns rather than it, even though in a sense, it makes the personhood of the object characters more emphatic. Another particular feature of Italian is that words can take on shades of meaning with the addition of suffixes, such as isimo, one, ella, ina. For example, a person who is allegro, cheerful, can become allegrissimo, very cheerful. 
In two consecutive sentences in Ferrante, we find benissimo, eccitatissime, and nerissima. Whereas in Italian, there's a kind of light emphasis in each word that moves the sentences along. If in English, you repeated very or some other intensifying adverb each time, the effect would be leaden. So it can be difficult to preserve the sensation without using too many words. Or to take another example from Ferrante, the sentence, tesessime procedemmo, literally, very tense, we proceeded. For the word tesessime, the superlative of teso, tense, modifying we, the unstated subject of the verb, there were many possibilities. Very tense, extremely nervous, edgy, anxious, and so on. The Italian word tesessime is an adjective, but because in English adjectives don't generally modify pronouns, you'd have that somewhat awkward, very tense, we proceeded. Not impossible, but awkward precisely in a way that the Italian is not. In the end, I decided to make the word an adverb, which creates a more natural sentence in English, as the adjective is normal in Italian, and I decided to use the word apprehensively, which seemed to combine the ideas of tension and nervousness and give some hint of the intensification of the very. Um, and in the end, it, well, actually, it was a more complicated situation, but basically, it was apprehensively we kept going. For a different type of solution, you could look at the word strada, street, which can be modified to become a stradina, a small or narrow street, or a stradone, a big street. In the Neapolitan novels, there's a stradone that is an important part of the neighborhood where, the, where most of the story takes place. After considering big street, large street, wide street, avenue, boulevard, <laughs> even Broadway, and so on, I decided to define the stradone at the first mention and then to leave the word in Italian. It seemed to me that the other solutions didn't have the right tone or would have become clumsy. Contrarily, the word rione, neighborhood, which also represents an important place and symbol in these novels, I did translate into the perhaps slightly less specific English neighborhood. Another practical difficulty faced by the translator is references and allusions that would be immediately understood by the reader in the original language. There are various types, literary, cultural, historical, geographical, and various solutions. Add a footnote or endnote, try to explain by means of the translation, or not explain at all, leaving it to the reader and Google, of course. <laughs> One of the main categories of reference is literary. And in the case of Levy, the most important is surely Dante. Sometimes, naturally, Levy himself signals the reference, as in the canto of Ulysses chapter of If This Is a Man, which is essentially made up of quotations from canto 26 of the Inferno. At other times, however, he quotes Dante without saying that it's Dante, and the reader has to understand on his own. At the end of the first chapter of If This Is a Man, he writes, Why a voi anime prave, woe unto you, wicked souls, which is a reference to Canto Three of the Inferno. Here, I decided to add a footnote. Sometimes an explanation can be included in the translation, especially when it comes to literary historical figures. Where Levy can mention Agnolo Beolco, the translation adds the Renaissance playwright Agnolo Beolco. In the context, it doesn't interfere. In an unusual reversal, Levy, in his poem Pious, uses the Yiddish expression oi gewalt, oh God, woe is me, familiar certainly to most Americans, whereas the Italian has a footnote to explain the meaning. It's actually Levy, it's Levy's footnote. Um, and in the end, we decided to leave the footnote with an indication that it's Levy's own note and not the editor's. But in a similarly unusual reversal, Alessandro Piperno's 2005 novel, The Worst Intentions, has references to Jewish rites and practices that in the original all have footnotes, but in English didn't need them, like Kaddish and various other things. Um, another category includes historical facts that may need to be explained. For example, the American reader is unlikely to know the significance of September 8, 1943, the date Italy surrendered to the Allies and the Germans took possession of northern and central Italy. There are several references in Levy's works. In one place, the author himself explains. In another, I added a footnote. Ferrante's Neapolitan novels, which cover decades of Italian history, contain references to the Red Brigades, the kidnapping of Prime Minister Aldo Moro, the MSI, or the Italian Social Movement Party, and so on. In a novel, I think it's generally better to try to get around using a footnote, although I have um, 
various colleagues who disagree, who love footnotes. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I thought that the first two examples, the Red Brigades and Aldo Moro, could stand on their own. In the case of the MSI, I added the word neo-fascist, the neo-fascist Italian social movement party. Another category of references is details of geographical and topographical places. In Levi's Turin, there is the Valentino Park, the Mole Antonelliana, Piazza della Crocetta. In the chapter Potassium of the periodic table, he writes, Gusts of cold fog rising from the Valentino overtook me. Here I decided to add the word park. There is also a reference to the Valentino in the first few pages of Ferrante's The Days of Abandonment. And again, I could easily have added the word park. In this instance, I didn't, since it seemed pretty clear in the context. In autumn, you could see the green of the Valentino grow yellow or red. For the translator, it's helpful to have a picture of what the writing is referring to, because the dictionary, that is, pure vocabulary, doesn't always provide the right word. Here, Google Street View is a great resource. And even if you don't use the details of a place in the translation, it's useful to have an idea, an image that gives some knowledge, not only of what the place looks like, but of what it may represent. In the Neapolitan novels, Michele Solara moves to a house in Posilipo, an area of Naples. I had spent some time there and had a picture of it in my mind as a beautiful place on a cliff above the sea with villas and views. I also thus had an idea of what it represented as a move into another world for the Solaras, even if I didn't literally use that knowledge in the translation. One fairly common category of references is those having to do with school. The Italian grading system uses numbers rather than letters, but instead of translating them translating them into R, A, B, C, and so forth, I've usually preferred to be descriptive, as in a poor grade, a high grade, and so forth. When Levy writes, Primo Levy received a degree in chemistry con 110 lode, literally 110 and praise. There's no need to explain to an Italian that this is a top grade. Possible English versions might be a first class degree, chemistry degree with top honors, degree magna cum laude, the final version reads degree in chemistry with honors. I've usually preferred this, but not always. In the Neapolitan novels, especially My Brilliant Friend, where school marks play a large role, I decided to leave the one to 10 grading system of the Italian, and at the first mention of grades, where Elena, telling us her and Lila's final elementary school mark, says, I passed with all 10s. I added the words, the highest marks. I don't think it's intrusive, and when grades come up again, as they do frequently in this volume, the reader has a context. These examples point to a more general question of tone and style. The translator is verbally conveying a text from one language to another, but as I said earlier, he is not trying, or I'm not anyway, <laughs> trying to create something equivalent. That is, Levy is writing about a particular place and a particular time, and it would be jarring to impose a different school or grading system. Similarly, Ferrante's novels are set in a particular place and at a particular time. And for a Neapolitan shoemaker to speak in a Brooklyn accent, or the child Lenu to say that on her report card she got all A's, would jolt the reader out of the place and the time, out of the reality of the novel. Every writer obviously has her or, or his or her own style. And so for the translator, his or her particular difficulties. Giacomo Leopardi qualifies, modifies, adds, exemplifies, limits, and expands meaning as if every sentence were a laboratory of working toward precision. Anna Maria Ortese constructs elaborate, sometimes surreal metaphors. Pasolini has his own version of Roman dialect. Ferrante's sentences are dense, often urgent, wanting to get somewhere. I'm going to talk in a little more detail about some of the problems in translating Levy and Ferrante as the writers that I've spent the most time with. In the case of Levy, one has to be perhaps most attentive not to be led astray by the necessary focus on the exactness of particular words. The sentence structure can be complex, but at the same time, the sentences are compact, precise, and balanced. This sentence from the chapter Hydrogen in the periodic table contains an entire education from the ignorant boy climbing a tree to the chemist or scientist trained to understand the natural word, world. The, the subject is hands. They knew the convulsive grip of the branch of a tree because we loved to climb out of a natural desire 
and at the same time, for Enrico and me, a confused homage and return to the origin of the species. But they didn't know the solemn, balanced weight of the hammer, the concentrated force of blades, which had been too prudently forbidden, the eloquent texture of wood, the similar yet different malleability of iron, lead, and copper. Then there's the science, including not just technical terms, but descriptions of intricate biological, chemical, or engineering processes or operations. In the case of the technical and scientific terms, the translator has to be sure of the correct English term, which may not be the dictionary term. In the essay, Asymmetry in Life, Levy writes of the way in which a sequence of amino acids can agomitolarsi. The dictionary definition is curl up or roll itself up, whereas the correct term for what a sequence of amino acids, a protein does in English, a scientist friend told me, is fold. Even when the subject is not explicitly scientific, there is an exactness of description and language that we associate with science and that can be hard to get right and readable. When the creature-like poem of the story The Fugitive is examined under the microscope, Levy writes, tiny hairs were sticking out from the page corresponding to attributes of the letters on the other side. In particular, the extremities stuck out, the legs of the Ds and Ps, the little legs of the Ns. The creatures in the story TV, TV fans from Delta, Delta Sep tell us, we have 10 armpits. We are all built according to decadal symmetries so that our length is the golden section of our radius. And then many of Levy's stories have words that are not necessarily scientific or technological, but which are unusual or even made up, such as dysphilasi, dysphylaxis, the opposite of prophylaxis, and nal, spelled K-N-A-L-L, -L, and defined as a small smooth cylinder, as long and thick as a Toscano cigar and not much heavier. There, <laughs> there are also essays that are specific, Levy stories, by the way, are amazing and they deserve to be better known. Um, there are also essays that are specifically about words or language where the translator has to decide how much to explain and what to leave to the reader. I think that some of these stories were excluded from earlier collections of Levy's works in English for that very reason. The essay, Leggere la Vita, and here the title was left in Italian, is about the der derivation of a phrase, Leggere la Vita, that means to gossip. And it is in, in it, Levy quotes sources in several languages. In the Argonne chapter of the periodic table, which on one level is about language, Levy translates the phrases and words in the Jewish Piedmontese dialect into Italian. I translated them into English only, so that so the reader misses seeing the relationship of the dialect to the language, but I thought it would have been too cumbersome to have both. In If This Is a Man, the various phrases in German and French were left untranslated, as in the original, in order to maintain the crucial sensation of the babble of languages. Finally, there's the language that is literally untranslatable, as in the story Dizzying Heat, whose protagonist can't stop making palindromes. Needless to say, I didn't try to make equivalents. <laughs> to give you an idea of what might go into the translation of a sentence, here's the first clause of a sentence near the beginning of the truce. Così per noi anche l'ora della libertà suono grave e chiusa. Word for word, the sentence reads, so for us, even the hour of liberty sounded grave and closed. In this case, the, syn the syntax is straightforward. In the second version, I changed liberty to freedom as perhaps more natural in English when speaking of the release of men who have been prisoners. And keep in mind, as I'm sure all of you probably as translators are trying to be translators, <laughs> no, I mean, all these choices and reasonings are personal, subjective, and even opportunistic. I mean, I might have a different idea myself on a different day. Um, anyway, then I changed sounded sounded to struck because it seemed to me that the connotation of a clock of the hour that strikes or chimes was that the hour that strikes or chimes was important. So for us, even the hour of freedom struck. And then came the two adjectives. Grave could be heavy or serious or solemn or deep, as in a deep sound. And although I thought there was something physical implied, the tolling of a clock tower bell, heavy or in a pair, heavy and closed, seemed perhaps too physical. But then I considered it in combination with solemn, which gives the sense of a ceremonial moment, formal and serious, solemn and heavy. But again, heavy seemed too limited. 
nor did I like the sound of solemn and heavy. Going back to the Italian, Cusa, I had the idea that these men are no longer closed, but feel, are no longer closed, but feel closed, and oppressive, while perhaps a bit of a leap, seemed to me to convey the idea of both physical and spiritual heaviness, of the men and of the moment. So for us, even the hour of freedom struck solemn and oppressive. In this brief example, I've barely mentioned sound and rhythm, but certainly they are a factor in the use and choice of words in a translation, of greater or lesser importance depending on the text. One other element enters into the translator's final decisions, and that is the unconscious or instinct, whose role I think, again, can't be underestimated. Ob or overestimated. <laughs> Obviously, too, a different translator might have had different ideas, different ways of thinking about a sentence, made different choices. One of the risks of translation is that you can always be second-guessed, especially by yourself. Ferrante's style is very different. The sentences are dense. She wants to get somewhere, as I said, and she can use a lot of words, not in a redundant way, but in order to reach the precise truth of, let's say, an emotion. And then she's, also, she's often describing emotional states. In a single sentence, she takes you through a range of actions and emotions. It's as if we were present at a search for truth. It can be tricky to preserve the intensity and the momentum created by the rush or pileup of words within an English syntax and without losing the meaning. There can be almost a sense of excess that you need to hold on to without it sounding melodramatic. This style is not conventionally beautiful, especially in the context of Italian literature. Ferrante has said that beauty of style doesn't interest her. Indeed, she speaks of avoiding it because she believes that it can get in the way of truth. Many readers have pointed out her tendency to write in run-on sentences, or my tendency to write in run-on sentences. Um, I think it's one of the ways in which she achieves that force and that intensity. And though it's true that Italian sustains such sentences more easily than English, I've tried to preserve the style as far as possible. Here in one sentence, she is capturing the character not only of her schoolmate Alfonso, but of his brother Stefano. Although his features were very similar to Stefano's, the same eyes, same nose, same mouth, although his body as he grew was taking the same form, the large head, legs slightly short in relation to the torso, although in his gaze and in his gestures he manifested the same mildness, I felt in him a total absence of the determination that was concealed in every cell of Stefano's body, and that in the end, I thought, reduced his courtesy to a sort of hiding place from which to jump out unexpectedly. And here is Nino talking to Elena after they've left their spouses to go together to the conference in France. But when we were alone, he made me a speech anxious in tone and passionate in content, whose sense was that I should trust him, that although our situation was complicated, we would surely untangle it, that to do so, however, we had to go home. We couldn't flee from Montpellier to Paris and then to who knows what other city. We had to confront our spouses and begin our life together. One of the most frequently asked questions about Ferrante's style is whether she writes in dialect. And the answer is that she doesn't, or only rarely. And then usually just a word or two. When she writes in Italian, he or she said in dialect, what follows is in Italian. Although since it's usually dialogue or the report of a dialogue, the language may be more colloquial anyway. Dialect is the language of the neighborhood, of home and family. It's the language of parents and children, of love, but also of violence and brutality. Italian is a language that children learn in school. But as Elena goes through school, her Italian changes. The Italian learned in elementary school is not good enough in high school. And when she gets to the university in Pisa, it's as if she had to learn to speak all over again. One of the first places where the dialect Italian division comes up is in My Brilliant Friend, when Ella, Elena and Leela climb the stairs to Don Achille's apartment to get their dolls back. Eventually, he gives them some money and tells them to go get new dolls. This conversation, we are told, with Don Achille's wife and children in the background and occasionally part of the, of the dialogue, takes place mainly in dialect. But as the girls turn to leave, Elena, on the stairs, says a sentence in, in Italian, Buona sera e buon appetito. Good evening and enjoy your meal. It's as if she were already separating herself from her surroundings. She has faced the ogre, Don Achille, and survived, and she is in some sense sealing this triumph and this division with a formal statement in an elevated language. Why did Ferrante choose not to write in dialect? 
For one thing, many Italians might not understand it, and she talks a lot about wanting to be read, to be accessible, to make the reader want to turn the page. Another reason that has been suggested is that because it is mainly a spoken language, though in fact Neapolitan does have literature, its effectiveness would be lost on the page. Whereas in the, in the movie of Ferrante's novel, L'Amore Molesto, or Troubling Love, dialect is used very effectively. Parts of the correspondence between Ferrante and the filmmaker, Mario Martone, are published in Frantumalia, her collection of letters and interviews. And in the TV series that was or is being made from the Neapolitan novels, the dialogue is in Neapolitan, and it was shown in Italy with Italian subtitles. Um, so. The translation of dialect is both difficult and problematic. The only, way I, the only way I've found to deal with it is when I've had to use, is to deal with it when I've had to, is um, to use a slangier, more colloquial diction. Italian or Neapolitan readers have said that they hear a kind of undercurrent of dialect in the supposedly dialect passages of the Neapolitan quartet, and I think that's true, if only in that the language is perhaps a bit looser although that's not a definition of dialect, obviously. Though, as I said, it is mostly dialogue or a paraphrase in Italian of what the speaker is saying. There are Neapolitan terms like tamaro, scarparo, mappina, for which I tried to find more colloquial, if not exactly slang words or expressions. For example, with the word tamaro, I started with boor or peasant, which was anachronistic. Then I tried yokel, which seemed almost literary, whereas <laughs> whereas something like redneck seemed too specifically American. Eventually, I got to hick. Is it successful? Well, I've been told it's not crude enough. So you never know. <laughs> um, in an essay on translation, Levy, who made a number of translations into Italian from German, enumerates some of the pitfalls in transferring a text from one language to another. Idiomatic phrases, local terms, false friends. He points out that it's not enough simply to avoid the traps, that the translator's most effective weapon is a linguistic sensibility. In a note to his translation of Kafka's The Trial, he said that he had tried to find a middle course between a propensity to smooth what was rough, that is, retelling the story in, he says, a language that has nothing to do with the original, and offering a line-for-line, -line, word for word transcription. He writes, I made a determined effort to balance faithfulness to the text with the, to the, to balance faithfulness to the text with the flow of expression. My goal as a translator of any writer has been to demonstrate that linguistic sensibility, maintaining a degree of, high degree of accuracy without losing the eloquence and spirit of the original. My hope is always that the margin for second guessing, especially by myself, is minimal. In a column in The Guardian, Elena Ferrante paid tribute to translators. Thanks to translators, Italianness travels through the world, enriching it, and the world, with its many languages, passes through Italianness and modifies it. Translators transport nations into other nations. They are the first to reckon with distant modes of feeling. Translation is our salvation. It draws us out of the well in which, entirely by chance, we are born. Thank you. And I'm Thank sure you. there are questions, uh, and uh, I think that was, uh, you took us inside your laboratory. To that some was the extent. idea. And that's great. <laughs> that I was think. the idea. And I confirmed, at least to me, what Levy was saying, that uh, translators yeah. are partly surgeons, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know that quote. Uh, and yeah. more, and more. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. First of all, thank you for this incredible speech. I was pouring while listening, oh. <laughs> almost sweating. Um, uh, my curiosity is, um, in your process of becoming more and more a translator, uh, how did you learn to navigate uh, and understand and perceive the different registers in Italian as a foreign mm, well, that's, speaker? Well, that's one of the, those questions that's hard to really understand. <laughs> I mean, hard to answer. Um, it's, it, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll add a little bit, um, because now I'm studying translations mm -hmm. from Italian into English. And for me, sometimes it's difficult 
to see if this register is respected or not. So, mm -hmm. um, um, I think, in a way, that's what Levy called um, linguistic sensibility. And it's, it's just something, I think, that comes from reading a lot in both languages, probably. Um, I mean, I spent, I spent most of my career as an editor as, and a copy editor. So I was very engaged in languages on a very, in a very deep, or with English, in a very detailed way. So I think that probably was helpful. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Hi, hello. <laughs> right oh, here, oh, oh. <laughs> in the corner. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm, I was very impressed with the, all the rewriting that's, that's, um, that you, you described. And I'm interested in asking you about um, your work as a translator, because you are also, you are also an editor, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you separate this work? Or do you see that? Do, can you tell you're, you're taking editorial decisions uh, or translation decisions, and also, <laughs> How is the work with the editors after you, you finish a translation? How is the process of, of getting the te that text to the market? Well, first of all, to answer your, the second part of your question, um, in, the sad truth is that most publishers don't do that much editing of translations. Um, Europa Editions, who publish um, Ferrante, among, other, among many other translations, are um, the, the, mother, the mother company is an Italian company. And in Italy, there is this tradition of checking translations, of, of having a person who knows both languages read, um, read the books, read the, the translation. And they've continued that to do that in, um, in the books that they publish in English. And that is invaluable. But almost no other publisher that I know of does that. Um, there's, I mean, another example, though, is um, New Directions of, publishes a lot of translations. And the editor there, Barbara Epler, and she's the, the sort of the chief, she doesn't know any other languages, but she's a very good editor of translations. So um, that, that is another publisher that edits translations. But generally, there's not that much editing done of translations. Now I forgot the first part of the question. Oh, <laughs> the, edit, the copy editing and editing. I mean, you know, they're sort of mutually reinforcing, I would say, um, to some extent. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can be more detailed about it. Hello. Um, I was curious um, how much at this point in your career, especially post-Ferrante, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. even before the explosion of interest into her work and into uh, Italian work, Italian writers that you have translated, um, how much uh, you still find authors through publishing houses in the United States, and how much are are you do you feel free to discover authors that interest you and that you just want to bring to Anglophone readers? Um, I actually almost everything that I've done has been brought to me by a publisher, um, by a. Um, either an American publisher or, um, I guess you could call Europa also an American publisher. I mean, a, an Italian pub, an American publisher. But I haven't really, tr I haven't done that much of uh, trying to get authors that I wanted published published. Um, but um, I think it's hard. You know, in this, in the, in, you know, in the. Context. Although I have to say, there are a lot of there are now a lot of small publishers that publish translations. So there are more more openings in a way for bringing for for bringing trans, more places you could bring a project that you wanted to that you that you liked. Hi. Thank you very much for the lecture. I was thinking about your first. Um, encounter with Italian as a language, mm -hmm. which was through Dante. So what happened with, this, with, with poetry? And um, you were mostly like um, translating prose. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever thought about translating poetry? And then the other question was your relationship with authors. So uh -huh. you were mentioning uh, Ortese, okay, Piperno, now Ferrante. Yeah. So how is, in, in this particular case also, right, the, 
uh, well, in this particular case, I guess it's impossible, but like the relationship with authors that you translate? Uh -huh. um, well, first of all, I, um, I wouldn't, I, I just, the idea of translating poetry terrifies me. So I really don't, I'm not, I don't really, I think that's just too hard. <laughs> um, prose is hard enough, so I, I don't think, I, I just always say that I'm not gonna translate poetry. Um, but, um, but I also have translated a lot of dead authors, so I have no relationship with the, <laughs> with the authors. Um, and then one very reclusive author. <laughs> um, the, I mean, I haven't, I actually, most of the um, writers that I've translated, I haven't had a close relationship with. I mean, I've been able to write to them and ask them questions that I have, but I haven't really worked with them. I mean, the one author, I sort of ironically, that I worked with the most was Aldo Buzzi. And he, that was, I mean, that's one of those things where you know, that translators are always talking about. I mean, that, that it's like a curse and a blessing because he was, you know, the author, he was always rewriting. That was really the worst of it. You know, <laughs> he was, you know, once his book, it was published in Italian, but it wasn't yet published in English. So he felt that he could just keep re, <laughs> keep changing things. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's always writers that think they know English is better than they really do know English or, so it's, it's a mixed situation. Hi, I was wondering if you also did the translation for the HBO series, and if there was anything interesting issues around um, that. I didn't. I well, I did. What I did was um, translate the the screenplay. I, I translated the screenplays for um, HBO, but as I um, learned, <laughs> um, the screenplays apparently are just st a starting point for what happens eventually. Um, I did this. I did the subtitles, or I edited the subtitles for the first two parts of the first season but I didn't do any, I didn't do the rest of the subtitles. But they, the f funny thing happened was that they, they originally wrote the screenplays in Italian and then they translated them into Neapolitan. So I could you know, work from the Italian. All of a sudden I started receiving these screenplays in Neapolitan. I was like, what? <laughs> um, so I had a little a quick, quick learning process um, of learning Neapolitan. But yeah, that's all, that's the only involvement that I had. I wonder how much you feel the ownership for the things that you've translated. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, yes, to some extent, I do feel that I, I do feel a kind of ownership. I mean, I feel an ownership as a, as a translator. For example, I feel like nobody else should translate Ferrante. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, I mean, specific authors. I know a lot of translators who don't feel that way, um, who feel that they can share their author. Um, I guess I do feel kind of that I own um, that I own the I I own the author, if not, and, and so I guess in that way I own the translation as well. Um, but I'm not the author. I do recognize the difference. <laughs> so this is a related comment. I was once in a conversation with the Turkish author Orhan Pamuk, and uh -huh. someone asked him how he felt about the translations of his novels in the languages that, that he knew, especially in English, uh, which was, it, it's very much a second language. And he said, uh, I don't really care, it's not my work. It's like I have yeah. completely disowned it. Mm -hmm. um, so in a, how would you feel that way about if about your authors, <laughs> if they were to say that? But wait, if my work was translated? <laughs> no, if, oh. if the, the oh. authors you have oh. translated said that this is not, what oh. you've done is not my work. Um, well, I mean, I, I, it's a, it's a difficult question in a way. I mean, it's, it's um, because I don't feel that, I mean, it, yes, it's true the English sentences are my work, but the book is not my work. Um, so it's, I guess it's both ways. I mean, I guess you want it both ways <laughs> in, some, in some sense. I mean, I know translators are always um, complaining about reviewers who quote big sections of, their, of the text and say, this writing, you know, so the, the author's writing, Pamuk's writing is really wonderful here or really something very, even more specific. And you think, wait a second, that's not his writing. <laughs> um, so, you know. This was fascinating. I'm just curious about your process. 
Um, do you have a productivity limit per day? <laughs> How long does it take to translate one of the four novels, for example? It usually takes as long as you have the deadline, as, as the deadline is. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe as long as you can stretch the deadline. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, those, those books were translated pretty quickly because they were, they were on a really specific deadline. You know, they had to come out at a certain, once, once they started coming out, they had to come out on, on this deadline. <laughs> so um, I'm as productive as I have to be, I guess. <laughs> May I ask you a question uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, Levy, uh, mm -hmm. the publication of Levy? Well, yeah. Because of course that involves also going back, revising, or perhaps changing, retranslating, uh, re so redoing the work that has been done by other translators. That's right, uh, yeah. So how was, how was this pro pro process? Because clearly involved also your uh, judgment about um, other translators, so colleague of yours, et cetera, et cetera. It was yeah. a goal, really, to come up with a consistent voice or or mm -hmm. there was some other consideration? No, well, the, when the Levy project started out, and one of the reasons I think it was so immense and so immensely long was that um, in the beginning, the, the Bob Weil, the editor at Norton, who had this idea, um, thought we could just, of just collecting all the Levy translations and putting them together in a, in a one volume or, well, three volumes. And as, when I started looking into it, I discovered well, first of all, that the translations were of different ages, um, and that and that so that putting them together would seem like a little bit of a mishmash. And also, we discovered that I discovered that um, many of the stories, well, certain number of the stories hadn't been translated at all at all, and most of them had been published in English in a really haphazard way. Um, you know, two from this book, three from this book. Let's put a few from this other book, and they and and in an inconsistent way. So once I decided that there should be new translations of everything, um, then I think it, I decided that it should be, it was really a question of my controlling the translators. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, of having one, of trying to get one, one voice or one, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't mean it to sound monolithic, but, and I'm sure there are differences, but I did what, what um, what editors, what European edit or Italian editors would do. I mean, I compared all the, you know, went over all the translations myself. So ultimately there was my brain, my translation brain overseeing all of the translations. Um, in the case of If This Is a Man, actually, there was, we, it was a complicated rights situation and couldn't, we couldn't get the um, English rights, the English translation, the English rights to retranslate it. But Stuart Wolf, the original translator, agreed to, um, to he, he had always wanted to revise his translation, and so this gave him an opportunity to do that. So it also became, you know, part of, part of the whole project. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, translation is often perhaps solely uh, described using very like tortured and mournful language, words like betrayal, curse, oh. <laughs> loss. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering why you think that might be. Why, oh, why it's, why? Because it's the easiest way to, to um, account for failures, I guess. Um, no, because it is, because it's very difficult, because you can never have something that's exactly the same. I mean, you can never, it, it can't be by definition. And maybe that's not the goal. I don't know. Um, but that might be a more philosophical question than I can answer. But I, I do think it's because it's so um, hard to, because there's so many elements um, involved in each um, aspect of it, in, in every word, as I, I guess I'm, I was trying to say that, you know, that, that there's no, I mean, there's, there's also positive words. I mean, you, you do get these, uh, these books that you would never have. But, um, but there's such a lot of um, work going into it. I guess there's, you, you always feel that there's, you, you know, you've lost something or you've made the wrong decision or that other word would have been better. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe somebody else has something more profound to say. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm still floored that you were able to uh, tackle reading the Divine Comedy after studying oh. Italian for <laughs> just one year. Um, so I'm wondering so both, uh, how long did it take you to really develop confidence um, in your level of Italian to um, translate anything? And also, um, because you spend so much time, I imagine, thinking about um, the difference in relationship between English and Italian, um, what do you think are do you have a preference between the languages at this point, or do you think a language has strengths or weaknesses over the other? Well, naturally, I think that Italian is the most beautiful, perfect language in the world. But, <laughs> but English has its strengths. <laughs> um, it's hard to say about in terms of confidence. I mean, I still feel like that I don't know Italian well enough, really. But, um, but I, I study it very hard when I, I mean, every translation is like studying the language really all over again. Um, and when you, you know, when you're translating, you really do end up, um, uh, I actually know a German translator who said that one, one of his authors, I can't remember who it was, said, you are gonna read my work more carefully and more, you know, more closely than anyone else in the world, even than me, I mean, <laughs> so, that's, I think that's really what it comes to, that you're really just studying every sentence of, um, of, what you're, of the writer's work. And if you have, um, I mean, I guess as a copy editor, is to you know, go back to that, uh, you, you're sort of, I mean, it again, it works both ways. I mean, learning another language, as somebody said earlier, is a way of learning your own language, but knowing your own language from a kind of analytical viewpoint is really helpful as a translator in understanding the other language. Great, thank you. Um, so this is maybe more a comment than, than a question, mm -hmm. but um, as you were discussing the, the retranslation of Primo Levi I, mm -hmm. um, and the, the desire to create a kind of single voice yeah. throughout the opera, I'm, uh, I was reminded of, in fact, the exact opposite move that was um, started by Penguin Books to retranslate Freud by different oh, I've heard authors. Oh, that, yeah. And, I mean, I read a lot of Freud in both languages, and, and, uh -huh. and the, the new translation was, uh, it, was a, it gave me enormous anxiety <laughs> because, mm -hmm. because, because it was so difficult to... Um, find the, you know, the voices were so many, right? So, uh -huh. there were, so it was a deliberate choice to translate huh. each piece by a different, you know, a different Why translator. Why do you think that was? I think in order to defamiliarize um, oh. the experience oh, of I the see. text. Is it the central truth? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, they did the same with Proust. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a question um, translators probably don't like to answer, but I'm going to ask it. Have you ever reached a moment where you are at a complete and total impasse and you are willing to sort of declare that you simply do not know what an author is trying to say? And I ask that question because uh, I'm thinking of my own experience. You mentioned uh, Primo Levi's uh, invention of words, mm -hmm. and uh, there's an author I was translating, a Brazilian author, and uh, she invents words, mm -hmm. uh, neologisms, and I would ask Brazilian, you know, native speakers of Portuguese what she was saying, and sometimes they would say, I have no idea. Yeah. And so I didn't want to just leave, this, leave you know, blanks in the text, mm -hmm. but I'm always curious about that, you know, oh, what, what you do when you just, you simply do not know what to do. How do you work yourself out? I, um, I walk around the house. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do a lot of walking around. Um, no, I mean, I, there's a lot of ways you can, you can solve. I mean, you can, again, you can ask, as you say, you can ask a lot of people, ask more than one person, several people, if they have any idea. Um, you can leave it, just leave the, leave the word in the, in the original language and try to explain it. I mean, with, with Levy, you know, a lot of times I did leave it, like this word K-N-A-L-L, -L, <laughs> where I just left it. I mean, there was really nothing 
to do with it. Whereas something like the other example that I gave, disfalasi, you could put into, you know, make it into the Latinate or Greek word in English. But um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's really, it's true. I mean, and you could leave it out. <laughs> um, so I guess I don't really have a good, um, good solution. Thanks so much for your talk and for your beautiful translations. Um, I'll out myself. I'm a translator of poetry, so I uh -huh. routinely traffic in the impossible. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I like it that way. Um, but I had a question that sort of follows John's, uh -huh. um, which is I've, I noticed that in many of your examples and also mm -hmm. in your work, which I've read, of course, mm -hmm. you tend to make in-text um, explanations or yeah. that that seems to be, at least from this talk, your preference. It and is. I'm curious about, and maybe this is also the mm -hmm. difference between publishing translations of experimental poetry with tiny independent presses versus the kind of publishing yeah. and translating you're doing, but I'm curious about the choice not to include some of those snag moments or moments of impossibility that John was uh -huh. asking you about as part of a translator's note to really expose some of those difficulties. Well, you could. I mean, that's true. You, you could. Um, and I have done that a few times. You know, in the levy, there was a few places where, um, where that was done. But um, I guess I just I have this feeling. And I, I'm sort of, I've become less um, hard line about it. I mean, I used to feel very strongly that if you're reading a novel, you don't want to be stopped by footnotes. Um, but I don't know, maybe you do. I mean, maybe you want to know what's going on. <laughs> I mean, I mean, for things that you don't know. Um, end notes are another solution, of course. Um, but of an essay. An essay, yeah, no, I know what you're, I mean, there's that too. But most, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's something that could be done. I mean, a little, I did a little bit of that in the introduction to the Primo Levi. But I'm mostly, I guess most of the books that I translate are not, you know, they're, they're books, they're, they're not books that where the publisher wants to have an introduction. <laughs> or maybe they would, I don't know. Anyway, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> yes. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, what advice would you give to young and aspiring translators in the room? Well, mostly, as I was saying earlier to Steen, you should have a day job. <laughs> um, you cannot support yourself as a translator. I mean, I, things are getting better, and there's, I mean, I, I have to say that thanks to Elena Ferrante, I think that the role of the translator has become more. Um, more, more seen, more vivid. Um, so people do tend to realize that there is a translator involved in bringing you this book. But, um, but it's still, it's not a, it's, it's very hard to make a living. I think William Weaver was one of the few uh, great Italian translator who was one of the few translators who actually made a living as a translator. Because he translated everything. everything. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yes, he had, and he, he had a lot, a lot of good stuff to choose from. <laughs> But, um, but I would say, you know, that trying, um, I mean, persisting, try, there's a lot of online places that publish um, like pieces of translations and, you know, getting, getting stuff published online that like, uh, you know, Words Without Borders, Asymptote, there's a whole bunch of other places that um, publish. And then these, these smaller publishing houses that are now, that are publishing a lot of translations. So that's, um, not very, um, not a lot. There's also a lot more, I guess, translation workshops. There's the Penn, those Penn Heim grants for translations in process. So Penn has a lot of um, resources. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but it's something. <laughs> well, you could also take courses in Italian if you want to. <laughs> yeah. <Italian>. Um, actually, <laughs> Susan, Susan, the translator, uh, German translator, Susan Bernofsky, has a blog called um, Translationista. And she has, there's a post on her blog from a couple of years ago, which is advice to, trans to young translators. So anyway, well, thank if you. If there are no more questions, why don't we uh, thank. thank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.